between Georgia Bernstein and Barbara Brackman. They were sort of the, the foundation, and I still think they're good foundations for someone. If you want to learn about history, start with Clues in the Calico. And if you want, to... and he knows history, as a lot of people say, because women didn't go to the war in 19th century, but. They were there, and they were part of the history. So I think textiles that women often worked with at home can tell a lot about their history as well that you can read in books. These women all then became my heroes, and then uh, Barbara Brackman's stuff in Quiller's newsletter, and so I, re I just read everything that I could read. Welcome to Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast. I'm your host, Yannickan Smucker. We are pleased to bring you a special episode of Running Stitch, recorded as part of Textile Talks, a weekly Zoom series created by six fiber organizations, including the Quilt Alliance, to bring public programming to the comfort of your own home during this time when so many cultural heritage organizations are not able to fully open to the public. Learn more about Textile Talks at quiltalliance.org. For this presentation, I had the privilege of interviewing Barbara Brackman, a pioneer of studying quilts as historical documents, and a noted quilt maker, author, and pattern and fabric designer. This episode features our interview with a couple excerpts from Barbara's 2011 Quilters SOS Save Our Stories interview. Barbara also shared some great images, which you can view along with the complete Q&A with audience participants at the Quilt Alliance's YouTube channel. Textile Talks is generously sponsored by Moda Fabric and Supplies, eQuilter.com, Schiffer Publishing, Misty Fuse, TheQuiltShow.com, CNT Publishing, Artistic Artifacts, Nine Patch Fabrics, RFL, Empty Spool Seminars, and Quilt Mania. Running Stitch, as always, is sponsored by the Robert and Artist James Foundation. And we are grateful to all of these organizations for recognizing the importance of preserving and sharing the rich history of quilts and their makers. I want to start off our conversation today with a clip from the 2011 interview that Meg Cox conducted with Barbara. This was conducted uh, in front of a smaller audience than we have here today. Um, it was at the Moda headquarters in Dallas. I remember being there at, uh, while it was taking place. Um, so I heard the interview uh, live at that time and now have uh, have worked with it um, in its newly digitized form. In fact, one of my students at Westchester University uh, created the index and curated the interview, the version that you can find uh, on the QSOS website. Um, but I'd like to, to hear the clip um, of Barbara describing um, buying a Kansas City Star pattern at a thrift store many, many years ago. Barbara, tell me about what you brought to uh, talk about in this interview. Well, I wanted to bring something that really has created some kind of a change in my life. And so I brought just a few Kansas City Star quilt patterns. They're old newsprint from the 1930s. And why I brought them is because I found them in a thrift store when I was probably 20 years old, and I went, ooh, you can make a lot of different quilts if you had enough patterns. And I, there were probably 50 in this package, in a, in a plastic bag, and I think I probably paid a quarter. And then I, I just absolutely became enthralled with them, and I sorted them in all the ways you can sort things. It's like when your little kid and your mother says, here, here, play with the thread, and you sort it by color, and you sort it by size. I sorted them alphabetically. I sorted them by stars. I sorted them by squares. And pretty soon, I became a junkie, and I <laughs> had to have more patterns. And so I was a thrift store and antique store haunter at that time, and so I would find them occasionally. But then I realized I didn't actually have to have the pattern. I just had to have a picture of the pattern. And they hadn't invented the photocopy machine, so I started putting patterns on index cards and sorting them in the same way I'd sorted the newsprint. 
so it really it, it changed my life completely. Had I not found this package of quilt patterns, I, I might have gone on to sort completely different things. But <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I am a compulsive sorter. Well, I think I can probably speak for all of us. We're, we're happy you found the the quilt patterns and that's what that, that, that's what you became a sorter of uh who knows how this could have gone uh in a different direction so my first question for you barbara is how has research changed for you since that first thrift store find well in the even in the past 10 years since that interview you know digital digital i moved about six years ago and I decided, I made a decision there. I was not gonna move all those patterns. So I gave them to the University of Nebraska because I wanted to get more digital. And I remember my friend Questa Benberry always saying, oh, I wish I hadn't given my stuff away. But then again, she didn't have her stuff to have to deal with. So I've had to get more digital. I forced myself. And then uh, lately things keep getting better and better. And my friend, Mary Kay Walvogel, who I hope is watching, she and I belong to newspapers.com and it's our best subscription. We love it. So I don't have to have a paper pattern anymore. If I'm looking for something, I can look it up in newspapers.com and find the day it was printed, what newspaper it was printed in, and make a copy and file it. And, uh, you know, it's on my computer and not, and not in my basement. So we're pretty thrilled about, about the, the fact that you have so many resources. And then having the the connection, you know, I used to see Mary Kay twice a year. Now I see Mary, I've seen Mary Kay four times this week. And we talk every day. We say, did you see this? Well, that was fabulous. Look at this. And, and I do it with other people too, um, you know, who are interested in this. Things have changed mostly digitally. And that, I mean, I could, you know, there's so many ways, um, not only with your friends like Mary Kay, but we started the Facebook page for Quilt History South, and that was sort of an experiment. I thought, well, would people, would people be interested in that? So a year and a half later, we have a thousand members, and it's very, very entertaining. Very, very entertaining, because people post ten times a day. We see ten different quilts a day, and then we we discuss things. And these are people I never would know. Some of them I'm friends with. And many people are very new at this and they just say, well, my grandmother made quilts and here's hers. Do you think they look Southern? And then we can go on and on. So it's digital that's, that's changed everything, obviously. So when you found those uh, Kansas City Star patterns back at a thrift store um, and started sorting and, and uh, looking at things, how did you know what you were looking at? Were you already a quilt maker at that point? No, but I really have, a. I guess I was when I, I was I just love pattern and I love fabric you know it's one of those sort of innate things many of us have when you're a little kid and you just just love looking at pattern love looking at fabrics so I had I had not I don't think I'd made a quilt by then I was 20 21 maybe um and but I all my I was from New York City and when I asked my aunts about I said do you have any quilts and they said Oh, honey, when we got two nickels to rub together, we got rid of them. So that was the attitude in my family. I love the two nickels to rub together. But uh, all my friends in college where I went in Kansas had quilts on the bed and I was insanely jealous. So I thought I would make one. How hard could it be? And so I picked the hardest pattern I could find, but uh, that was it. So I know you've... Uh moved a lot of your collecting and sorting into digital realms now. Uh, and as you said, that you were able to offload some of the paper patterns uh, to a, a good collection. Um, but what are all the files that you save now on your computer? I know you have an enormous catalog of photos of quilts. And I mean, they're probably all in your head as well. But um, uh, I want to let's listen actually first um, to a brief clip from your 2011 interview in which you talked back then, again, yeah, 10 years ago. So we all know a lot has changed technically since then. Um, but let's listen to Barbara describe uh, learning how to use Photoshop and saving photos. When it comes to the technology, then you mentioned Photoshopping and rotary cutters. Are, are you, what about the other things that you have in your arsenal? Well, I am still a collector. I'm, that's, uh, well, 
you know, that would be on my grave, obsessive compulsive, <laughs> but put it to a good cause. Um, the computer, the, the computer just crashed because I had too many pictures on it. So now I'm collecting pictures. I, for my entertainment, I will sit for an hour and go through the auctions, look at the quilts. I have certain things I'm collecting. One thing is a quilt that has a date actually on it. I have a little, little routine I go through every day, look for dated quilts on the online auctions. Then I take, I, I save three photos, the overall, the shot of the date, so I can prove to myself that that's actually the date, and then a detail to show the fabrics. And I have hundreds and hundreds of those. I save everything as large as I can, which is the cause of the recent crash. And, but I also save, I have enormous files of things that amuse me, images that amuse me, religious images, holy cards, um, icons, things like that. And so what I do is I manipulate those things. And I want to learn how to get, I wanted to learn how to get good at Photoshop for two or three reasons. One is I would have to sew less if I could really do a, a convincing mock-up of a quilt. And so that was my, one of my early intentions. So is this a um, daily habit continued? Do you still oh. keep saving photos? Mm -hmm. Yes, I just keep getting bigger computers. <laughs> That's a good story. And you know, I just got a new one because I had to for the new block base. I had to have a new operating system. My comp old computer is as old as that interview. Uh, and it wasn't, wasn't a happy camper. So I got a new computer and, and now I'm transferring files. And it tells me every day how many I transfer. And there are more than 100,000 pictures on there. It's terrifying. But I have a very good visual memory, yet I can't add or subtract, but I have a great visual memory. That's what takes up my brain. So I, I know where a lot of them are. And now that I'm transferring, I'm trying to make the filing system better. Um, because it, it does no good to have things if you can't find them, as we all know. So, uh, and then I had to get a new Photoshop. And there's a new interface. And, but you know, I forced myself to practice. It's the old Malcolm Gladwell rule of 10,000 10, practice hours to get good at something. And that's, that's one reason I do save these things is that, uh, and, and manipulate them, is that I want to get good at this. And it's certainly good for, for the pattern business that I'm in and the fabric business that I'm in. You know, there was a time in the fabric business when I couldn't manipulate a picture at all. And, They'd send it to someone in, in Japan to do that, and it would come back not what I intended. So, so that's one reason. You know, there's several reasons for my business that I had to get good at Photoshop. How do you, when you have, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images, how do you, how do you sort them? Do you have a database or, or how do you keep no, track? No, it's just, you know, the program, the PC just has a pretty good, pretty good face interface where when I give everything numbers, you know, and, and I've been doing, so say number four is um, pattern style or quilt style. And then under that is one, two, three, four, and one might be Southern, two might be New England, three might be New York. So it's all logical. Now I should have been a librarian. And, I, and if I did that for a living every day, I probably would have gone home and painted pictures at night and not done any sort of, but I try to use what I've learned from library science, you know, and, and having subcategories and decimal points and things like that. And I, I have to say, I really do enjoy it. There's a, there's a new book out on people who are compulsive sorters by one of the Baron Cohen brothers. And he says, we're all crazy, but he's one too. I mean, that's why he wrote the book. So it's just quite easy for me to find these things. And I did one reason it's taking long to transfer from the old computer to the new is that I'm trying to improve the system, trying to improve the numbers. Um, but I do know that my best, my, I, I look at a place, you know, I, I look for something by place. So at the public library, when they ship those books, I can't find anything. I know exactly where they were. And I also look for color. So I do try to color code things. I'm a, a very oriented to color. It's, you know, there's many people like me and we mostly call them librarians. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but then there's people, you know, looking at slides of, of COVID virus every day and sorting it. I mean, that overwhelms me. I should have been one of those people and put my, put it for the good of mankind, you know, this obsessiveness, but, but no <laughs> quilt patterns. Well, that works for some of us as well. Um, so 
I've been really fascinated in recent years as the technology, particularly for image recognition, keeps getting better and better. I, I know of a couple different initiatives um, that are trying to harness artificial intelligence uh, to, to read images. And I know this has now been applied to, to quilt patterns. Um, there was even, I'm sure many of our participants today might be familiar with the quilt index. There, there was a uh, an attempt a few years ago at, at getting computers to read the patterns and um, uh, Emily Bodie, uh, up and coming fashion designer, uh, she has been working with Microsoft to develop a, an AI tool for quilt pattern recognition as well. And there's something that strikes me that we humans can do some of that better. What do you, what do you think of this whole idea of artificial intelligence and uh, reading quilt patterns? Well, you know, I, my father was a computer programmer. I mean, one of the first for AT&T. And so I was raised with that kind of attitude. And so I have thought from the beginning, you know, it's not that hard. It's there's, but you have to emphasize the seam lines. I don't know how AI would do that. I mean, I'll sit, I'm not, this is something I love. I'll, I, there was a quilt on eBay today that I thought, what is that pattern? It took me, I would say, three or four minutes to figure out the blocks were on point, and then the sides came in, and then I recognized it as not number one nine two six. You know, <laughs> but I don't know that the AI could ever go to that sophisticated level because the seams, the seams have to be assumed. But then again, I don't know anything about AI, although I use it every day. I mean, everything I have here is AI. I just didn't have to program it myself. So I, you know, my dad one time when he was working for AT and T said. Kids someday will be able to talk on the phone and see each other. And we said, oh, I can't believe that. And besides, who would want to do that? So um, I've been thinking about that for 40, 50 years, but I'm not the one to do it because I don't program that well. And I think there are limitations. There's, there's assumptions. But then again, you know, uh, spell check knows what I wanted to say. <laughs> most of the time, most of the time. Right. Um, but obviously you're not just a robot who can identify quilt patterns either. So there's so much, particularly readers of your blog, Material Culture, um, uh, and the other, the other blog, uh, Civil War Quilts as well. I guess there's, there's a series of, of interrelated blogs. Um, we'll know that you're, you're much more than just a expert at giving us the correct name and as the number for a quilt pattern. What are ways that you uh, investigate more of the, the qualitative side, the culture and social aspects of, of quilts, the, the parts about quilts that, that tell us about the history in the context? Well, I, I, I hate to confess to this, but kids, quilt patterns are just a way to get your attention. I am far more interested in women's history and social history. And, you know, my background, I worked at the State Historical Society for many years in the public, in Kansas, in the public programs. And so we're always trying to, you know, give our message and in trying to get people interested in women's history and the true history of Kansas, a very interesting place. So I realized when I was back there working there, when they used to have money to pay us, um, that I, you can use these things to tell a true story of women's lives. And that's very, very important to me. So the Civil War quilts, I mean, I'm fascinated by the fact that their Civil War and quilts are so intertwined. I mean, I can't believe year after year, I can keep coming up with a new little <laughs> novel uh, quilts that no one's seen before. But the story is, I wanna tell you about the Civil War from the wife's perspective, from the daughter's perspective. And I wanna tell you unpleasantly. I want it to be like the newspapers. I want you to know this guy molested children, you know, I, this senator. And here we have Elizabeth Gresham Brown. I just picked her up. She was the governor's wife of, Can of uh, Kentucky and she made a beautiful crazy quilt with a flag there. And when I started poking around in her life, I realized her husband abused her terribly, physically. She was tiny. She was probably four nine, four ten, And she left a diary in which she says he beat her. And, you know, here's the governor of Kentucky. So someone wrote me, she said, I'm not reading your blog anymore. I like nice stories. Well, fine. 
I don't, I don't need you. You're not going to hear stories that have that gloss on them. No sentiment here. There's no sentiment here. And so I'm fascinated by women's courage, by the amazing fact that they supported themselves while everybody pretended they didn't. You know, everybody says, well, 90% of women in the 19th century got married. Well, this is true. But at any one time, only 60% were married. Their husbands died. They ran away. They were insane. They uh, were alcoholics. What, how did those women support themselves? And it's, you know, my mother was not permitted to work. It was, it would have made my father mortified. And so it was just the way I was raised. Women didn't work. And, you know, when I'm 15, I go, well, what do you do all day then? But uh, it's, I'm trying to tell the story of women's lives and, and also just an accurate history, according to my, my standards anyway. So uh, I'm using both those blogs for that purpose. But I also, I, I really, as you can see, I like an audience. <laughs> you know, a thousand people reading what you write every day. So that's another thing. For me. So what are some of the strategies um, that you use when you're researching those aspects, the women's history, the cultural history of quilts. Um, I, Mary Kay also turned me on to newspapers.com and I find it uh, fantastic. I know that's one amazing primary source that you turn to as well. Um, what are some of the other ways that, I mean, to quote the title of one of your more famous books, what, what are the clues in the calico that you turn to? Well, in the quilts, you know, people have stories about the quilts that come or pass down in the family. Sometimes they're accurate and many times they're not, but then that comparison, why would they say that when it's not true? Well, of course, the, they have this narrative that's family history that they're trying to promote and also cultural history. And so you compare the story of what you think that quilt is to what the uh, family story is. And, and most of the time they're fairly accurate. So I have a, an online friend who just showed a picture of a quilt that her great grandmother that has to do with the great hanging in Gainesville, Texas during the Civil War. 42 men were hung within a couple of days for their supposed Union sentiments by the, uh, the militia of the town. You know, something, something that's very much echoes what we're seeing lately. Just complete mob control, mob, mob out of hand. And this went on for days where they just kept hanging people. So I thought, well, that's a very interesting story. How true is it? So then you go to newspapers.com to see if you can find stories about it. And I haven't been able to find much. You go to find a grave to see what, which is a great resource um, to see, you know, who was born when, and sometimes there will be an obituary attached there. You go to the um, great, the great uh, Latter-day Saints family search, which is free that you can find people in the census and many other death records and things that will tell you, you know, when she died and what she died of, which sometimes is very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things we never notice because it was kept so quiet is suicide in the 19th century. And I'm just, I get more and more cynical all the time. He died suddenly, no disease. He was kind of bummed and then he's dead. And you know, nothing, nothing ever, but that's, I, so I use my own cynicism here too, and my own, my own experience. As I say, I worked in mental health for many years, and uh, I, I saw a lot of things that most, you know, most people who don't work in mental health don't know a thing about, and let's just keep it like that. So I, I'm trying always to look for the, for the underlying story that, um, as my mother used to say, nice people don't talk about that. Do they? So. That, so you're, you're reading between the lines and not um, just in the quilt pieces, but also, yeah. Um, okay, wrong. Very wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do see uh, some questions coming in about the new edition of the Encyclopedia of Peace Quilt Patterns. Can you tell us about uh, what is new in this new edition? Well, this will be the, the third edition, actually the fourth. The first one was the index cards. Then I photoshopped or photocopied it when they invented the photocopy machine and punched holes in it and put it in notebooks and sold it. I probably sold a thousand copies. Here's my dear friends, Joyce and Cuesta. 
and they everybody said you know we would we would buy that if if we could and so i made this photocopy thing then american quilter society in 90 1990 just took my photocopies and made a thick book and then they stopped publishing books and so it went out of print and it sat out of print for quite a while but at, at uh, eq penny mcmorris and dean had decided that it would be great to program and so I let them program it. I, I kind of knew the idea, but they're great programmers. And so they programmed it. And then operating systems change. That's a real, it's a real tragedy when an operating system changes. <laughs> but they do. And so they had to put it out of print because it didn't work with Windows 10. And, and it didn't work with Macs. So at EQ, they said, well, let's try it again and let's update the operating system. And I said, great, you know, uh, and they did it. I mean, I didn't do any of this. Now, they, I added 150 or 170 new patterns. Hmm. Uh, and I did get to proofread, and they had a lot of questions. Why are these two the same? Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh, same pattern, two different numbers. Well, operator error, just, you know, eliminate one. So I did some proofreading, but it was the staff at EQ. And then once we got it all sort of into the idea of, of the new operating system and new colors, which was my idea. Let's, let's coordinate each page. Um, I said, well, we could redo the book. All we have to do is print out the stuff there. So we did. I mean, I was thrilled. It, this, this is a great dream. There's not going to be a fourth edition for this. I'm 75 years old. <laughs> so, so we all have to consider this the definitive edition. Oh, now. Well, you know, I'll leave my <laughs> leave my copyright to somebody and they can do it but and of course the operating system will change again so uh yeah rod says applause to electric quilt lists and they are fabulous and, and it's selling the thing is i kept saying i'm going to bankrupt this company single-handedly <laughs> it's, it's sold out so we had to do a second printing so there's obviously there's obviously a lot of people who need four thousand quilt patterns it's true. <laughs> um, uh, there is just a, a question that's come in uh, about where where someone can buy it now. Is it, it is back available in stock? Yes, again? and you can buy it from EQ, or you can ask your local quilt shop, whether it's online or you know in the store, to buy it. They can retail it. Um, it's there's certainly a lot of sources, and I would imagine that that will keep it in print if it, as long as it's profitable. And the operating system on reading hasn't changed and hopefully won't. So. There's a related question about clues in the calico. Um, is that ever going to be uh, updated, reprinted? Oh dear, more work for me. <laughs> now, you know, you can buy that digitally. It's still in print digitally. You can buy it from AQS. And the great thing about having it digital is you can say, you can do a search for a word like uh, crazy. And then it'll instead of looking at the index in the back, which might have five entries for crazy, but not every time the word crazy is mentioned. So I, I use the digital versions of all these things, the PDFs, because you, of the search feature. Um, I have, you know, I took clues in the Calico, which I wrote 1979, I think. But, and I made, for TNT, I did two, two new books, one called, um, let's see, America's uh, Printed Fabric, which was about just an expansion of the 1900s. And then the second one was Making History, which was an expansion of the 20th century. So that information is still available in those books, um, but it, it's not organized quite the same. And it's certainly more information than the second and third books. So it's still out there. Um, sure. And then Mary Kay and I've been talking about we should do patchwork soon. And there's so much more. We could go to find a grave. And then she just did that yesterday and found out that someone remarried and has a different name. And that's why we could never find her again. So, so that's what I was wondering. Um, yeah, both patchwork souvenirs. Um, oh, I happen to have it right next to me, in fact, um, uh, which is a book I'm consulting regularly as I work on my current research, Patchwork Souvenirs of the 1933 World's Fair. So this book, Clues in the Calico, other, um, other books and projects you've worked on, now that as more and more um, 
primary sources become available digitally as you continue to do research and sort and find photos, would do you have new things to add to these books? You if know, you I would. I for three or four years and that was lovely. <laughs> it was lovely. I really, I don't know. I just don't know what I'm going to do next. And, uh, but I, as I, I told you before, I'm compulsive and I have a lot of ideas. Uh, I don't know what would happen next, but we, I mean, it's so appealing to go, to go back to that patchwork souvenir story, which was that the, that the contest was enormous, put on by Sears for the World's Fair. They offered an outrageously generous prize and the woman who won it did not make the quilt, but had hired people to do it for her and did not share a nickel or two nickels with the people who made the quilt. Now, this shocked us at the time. Well, what does this do to our whole idea of quilting is sweet and folky and ladies doing it in their leisure? Who would make quilts for money? Well, now I've spent years on this idea of people who had to make a living and were very skillful at making quilts for money. So, uh, you know, we have this Wallace Nutting picture up here. Of that's how it was done romantically in a, in a dark room there. But what I have found and trying to re, I had to recalibrate my thinking, which is of course a new operating system, but is that so many of the quilts that were made in the 19th century even were one made by people who had family in the fabric business, perhaps an advertisement for the husband's dry goods store. Another thing is so many were made by people who had a business making quilts, quilting quilts, and probably selling patterns. I found quite a bit about stores in the 1850s that sold patterns, hand-drawn, hand-punched patterns that you could put powder through. And so we don't know a thing about, about this yet. I mean, I just have an idea and, and my cynicism is always, um, she didn't make that just for her artistic interests. She made that because she needed money or she was smart enough to know it's really gonna sell silk at the husband's dry goods store if she has a crazy quilt hanging in, just like down at Sarah's Fabrics. If you've got the model, you'll sell the fabric. So I would, you know, that's someplace we want to go. And then I think we could explore the whole patchwork souvenirs thing much better from the point of view of the women who made the quilt instead of, uh, yeah, what was going on completely in the 30s, which was so hard for everybody. Um, well, I can't wait to learn more. I mean, that's a topic that fascinates me, uh, this idea of, of making quilts as part of one's living. Um, I don't know if my mom's on the, this call or not, but uh, my great grandmother uh, was earned her living uh, by quilt marking. So it's always been a fascinating topic to me because um, I, know, I know that there's many more professionals out there, uh, and particularly oh, yeah. during yeah the Great Depression uh, everyone was trying to make money however they could. Yeah. Um, and the great way, you know, during the depression it was a great way to make money because there was a revival of interest in them. And uh, there were just some things going on. I just read of a woman in the, um, in a newspaper who wrote 1935, maybe she said, every so often I buy a hundred pounds of scraps from a local apron company. And then she made quilts with them and sold them. So something I never thought of apron factories. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> so you've already sort of begun to answer this question uh, without me even posing it. What are some of the other things that have really surprised you uh, the most during your years of researching quilts? Well, you know, the, we have the, the New York Beauty slide up there. I think this surprised me very much early on once I got to looking at the sources is that the pattern names we take so for granted, and we can argue about New York Beauty all day and we do sometimes, that the pattern names that we have for these things are not what they were called in the 19th century. Often we don't know the names, but then we do. And I, you can start an argument anywhere by saying it's not a New York Beauty, it's a poke in the White House. And we, we're talking about James Pope, excuse me. <laughs> But uh, James K. Polk in the White House. And one of the great things is with the quilt index, you know, they asked people before they pulled them in and they said, what do you call it? And the minute you say to someone, it's New York Beauty, 
they go, well, an official person told me it's New York Beauty. I'm never going to tell anybody again at James K. Polk in the White House. So that surprised me at first. And, and I've really pursued that. Now that's my standard. We have a name, but it was probably made up by one of those women who was making a lot of money selling quilts in the 1930s and knew that a romantic name, an a exciting name would sell more patterns. So uh, that's, that's one thing. And the other, the other is the idea of the women's work. What's my next slide? The next slide that help. I don't remember. Well, the quilt making is a commercial enterprise. And then there might be a third one too. The third thing. Oh, that you can, this is recent that, you know, I, we have a gut feeling we call it, but we are connoisseurs. We have seen so many quilts. And you know, we look at a quilt like the one on the right there and go, oh, it's gotta be Southern. But then everybody goes, well, why would you say that? You know, and you go, it's on the right side of your brain and you can't put it into words. Well, I just know it is, you know, I just have this gut feeling it. So what I'm trying to do with the Quilt History South Facebook page is to force people to talk about what their gut feelings are. Oh, they fight, they fight. But they, but I, I kind of pester them a little bit and they can start putting it into words. And I think we really have been able to quantify the Southern style over the past year and a half. I've got a checklist there that I'm going to talk about at AQSG in the study center on Saturday. And I, I think you could practically almost have artificial intelligence doing that. <laughs> you know, he could say to himself, hmm, is that a half a block on the side? Why are there only three blocks? <laughs> you know, three half blocks instead of four. What happened to the other ones? But color, sashing, um, border, that use of the, the partial blocks is very, very Southern. So that was my third thing. And that's a fairly recent discovery. Yeah, and I suppose, um, I mean, there's a lot of regionalism. I mean, I'm, I'm curious if then we can apply this sort of concept to other regional styles. Um, I'm thinking back to that. Um, I mean, I think it was in the early 90s, the What's So American About American Quilts um, Symposium. I don't know, you might have been in attendance, um, but this concept of figuring out what are these regional styles? And I think that's, yeah, maybe we could train an AI uh, robot to, to look at quilts in that fashion, but I think we're gonna keep needing humans to a certain extent as well. Well, I've also been working on New York style. Uh, you know, I don't have to work on Baltimore style. There are people doing that, but mm -hmm. uh, New York style and samplers, and I could tell an AI, it could be easy to program. Is if there's a cat and a horse, it's from New York. <laughs> It'd be really easy. That's my, my, my but New York style. Uh, we're not, I don't think we're going to see Kansas style. I don't, some places, but places where people live generation after generation. Um, and, uh, you know, like, and have a, a separate culture. I think we would see more regional style. But, uh, you know, Maine style, there's places to explore. But I am working on New York because I wanted to do a, an album sampler and put a cat in it. Wow, <laughs> and a horse. So that kind of leads me to our my last question before I start to turn more to the Q and A. Um, you've started to name a few of these things, but what what is it that we still have left to learn about quilts? Well, women's lives. We we have to get more accurate. It we are so under the assumptions that um, folk, folklorists, sort of folklorists had made it mountain quilts from the, you know, the 20s and 30s. Nobody realizes that those mountain quilt makers went to schools to learn how to make those quilts to sell to the tourists. Things like that, where our basic assumptions about the, I hate to use the word folky, but the folkiness of it, the, uh, the hearth and home kind of attitude about it, while completely negating that it's a commercial enterprise. Um, we I think we have to come back beyond that. And I certainly think we need to know more about women's businesses. Now, it's, we're pretty stalled because you read the census, it says no occupation, but because that, that was just the standard. And I think we have, we've been talking, Mary Kay and I have been talking about business records. We have to get access to business records. Now, Harvard has the, the, I think it's Standard and Poor's business records, but you have to go to Harvard to look at them. 
And that, that might tell us who was a seamstress in 1845 in Baltimore. Um, but they're not easy to access. And I, I don't even know how to look at business records. Um, again, it, there's addition and subtraction, something I'm not good at. So, <laughs> But I think that there, we have to explore new ways to look at these women's lives besides our cliches about them. Well, um, you've definitely been a model to me in, oh. in how to do that sort of thing. And um, I hope that as, as we continue to research quilts uh, in the subsequent decades, um, that we'll, we'll con I'm sure I will continue to, to turn to Clues in the Calico and Patrick's Souvenirs and some of these other books as I continue to, to hopefully expand this uh, story of quilts in women's lives in particular. Um, yeah, I'm so proud. I am so proud of you, Yuck. So, Thank you. So that, that's a great thing. You know, I'm a teacher at heart. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of our time today. Uh, I want to thank you so much for this fantastic conversation, Barbara. It's just been so fun. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm glad to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah, I, know. I, seen you in a long time. Yeah, I think it, last we saw each other back at the DAR Museum, uh, um, back when we got to do these things in person. Remember, you can enjoy the entire interview with Q&A and the very animated face of Barbara Brackman as part of the Textile Talks recording posted on the Quilt Alliance's channel on YouTube. Tune in weekly to Textile Talks at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. You can uh, register to get the Zoom link for that. And for more great presentations brought to you by the Quilt Alliance and partners, including the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and the Surface Design Association. See you next time here on Running Stitch. Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast, is a project of the Quilt Alliance, a member-supported national nonprofit dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing the stories of quilts and quilt makers. Running Stitch is hosted and written by me, Yannick and Smucker, and I serve as co-producer with QSOS project manager, Emma Parker, with support from Quilt Alliance Executive Director, Amy Milne. This podcast is generously funded by the Robert and Artist James Foundation. QSOS oral history interviews are archived with our partners, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries and at the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. You can listen to full interviews and see photos of quilts at our website, qsos.quiltalliance.org. Running Stitch features music by Chris Ezelgroth, accompanied by a singer featherweight, and Amy's best sewing shears. <laughs> <laughs>